listening, you're watching Arirang News at 8. It's Friday, February 21st here in Korea. Live from Seoul, I am Yu Ji-hae. We begin this evening with day two of the emotional cross-border family reunions. The tears of joy and sorrow continue today at the North Mount Kumgang Resort. As hundreds of South and North Korean families met three separate times throughout the day for a total of six hours. Now for more, we are joined by our Kim ji in the studio. ji give us a wrap-up of the day's events. Well, the second day of the first round of reunions held on Friday this morning at 9 a.m. with individual meetings between family members. It was a chance for the 80 or so participants with, their, with accompanied by their 56 members to meet behind closed doors in the individual hotel rooms that the South and North Korean families are staying in. They exchanged gifts such as food and clothing and shared stories about their lives and families back at home. Those meetings lasted until 11 a.m. and were followed up one hour later by a group luncheon that included all the participants. And after that, the third and last event of the day was a group ceremony that ran from 4 to 6 p.m. A jam-packed day indeed, but I hear that not everyone was able to participate in all the events. Why is that? Right. During the, unfortunately, during the first session of the reunions this morning, two South Korean members had to head back home due to health reasons. 91-year-old Kim Sung kyung and 84-year-old Hong shin ja did get to meet individually with their loved ones from the North yesterday and today, but had to do so in ambulances this morning. Kim met his daughter and his son, and Hong, who is a retired nurse, met her younger sister who told her aving sibling before leaving that she was glad to have met her again and would wait for her until reunification. And these early uh, departures serve as a reminder that certainly time is running out for many of the families, most of whom are in their 80s and 90s. Right. I mean, um, in fact, according to a recent survey by a Hyundai Research Institute, some 53% of, fam- of, of the members of South Korean members with families in the North are older than 81, which is the average life expectancy of South Koreans. And of the 129,000 South Koreans who have put their names on the waiting list for the reunions, 45% have already passed away, never getting the chance to speak to or embrace their separated family members. So there's a growing call to have more than just more than just the uh, current 80 or so members participate per round and for reunions to be held more regularly. And as a response, the South Korea's rival parties have called for further reunions. Uh, Senator's party floor leader Choi Kyung-wan said Thursday that Korean, the Korean government government needs to do more to uh, make sure that the reunions are held in a more regular basis. Uh, Democratic Party leader, floor leader Chung byung un said that uh, time is running out and there needs to be uh, the korean government needs to do more for so that the participants in these reunions increase in the future Mm, i see well assuming the reunions go ahead without a hitch now what's next what can we look forward to uh well if there are no disruptions the second group second round will be held next week and about 360 south korean participants will arrive at mount kungang on, Mon- uh, on Sunday to meet with their 88 of their North Korean relatives. And this second round will start with the group meeting at 3 in the afternoon on Sunday. South Korea will then host a welcoming dinner at the Mount Kungang Resort later that night. And on the next day, individual and group meetings are scheduled. And, the- and this round of reunions will wrap up on Tuesday. All right. Thank you very much, ji for that report. There's our Kim ji reporting on the cross-border reunions of families separated by the Korean War. And the goodwill between the two Koreas continues. The South Korean government has given two private organizations the green light to send about $1 million worth of humanitarian aid to North Korea. Seoul's Unification Ministry made the announcement Friday and said the humanitarian shipments will be mainly composed of an anti-tuberculosis drugs and baby milk powder. So far, five private organizations have been given permission by the government this year to send aid to the North worth more than $1.5 million. 
Korea-Japan relations, which have plunged to one of their lowest points in many years, are showing no sign of improving. This after a top Japanese official suggested the need to re-examine Tokyo's 1993 apology for its wartime atrocities, not to mention the country's ongoing campaign to raise awareness about its claims to the Korea-controlled Tokdo Islets. Our Kim Young bin reports. In 1993, Japan's then chief cabinet secretary, Yohei Kono, apologized for the tens of thousands of women that were forced into sexual slavery during World War II. But on Thursday, Tokyo's current cabinet secretary, Yoshihide Suga, said the Japanese government will re-examine the so-called Kono statement to verify the accuracy of interviews given by Korean women who said they were forced to serve as prostitutes for Japan's wartime military. We will assemble a team of government officials and experts to re-examine the 1993 statement from an academic standpoint. Seoul has condemned Tokyo for making moves to take back its apology and disregard its imperialistic past and historical wrongdoings. Unlike Japan, Germany has made and continues to apologize for its wartime atrocities and compensates victims to this day. In a separate issue, Korea has slammed the Japanese government's plan to hold its controversial Takashima Day ceremony on Saturday and attempt to claim Korea's Tokdo Island as their own. Takashima is the name Japan uses for Tokdo Island. Korea's foreign ministry has also slammed Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's plans to send cabinet members to the annual event. The Korean government is calling on Japan to cancel the ceremony, but Tokyo has dismissed Seoul's demand, saying the celebration does not concern other nations. Korea reclaims sovereignty over its territory, including Tokdo and many other islands around the Korean peninsula, upon its independence from Japanese rule in 1945. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. If South Korea can expect any progress on denuclearizing North Korea, it'll need China's help. With that in mind, visiting Chinese Vice Foreign Minister Liu Zhenmin held talks with Seoul's Deputy Foreign Minister Kim Yong-su, Yi Yong-su that is, on the North's nuclear program, agreeing to strengthen cooperation to rid the communist state of its nuclear weapons. Liu arrived in Seoul on Thursday after a four-day visit to North Korea, making him the first high-ranking Chinese official ever to make back-to-back -back trips to Pyongyang and Seoul. On Saturday, the last day of his visit, Liu is scheduled to meet with Seoul's Foreign Minister Yun Byung-se and Unification Minister Liu Gil-je. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning, which is still very much in its infancy stage, having been formed just one year ago, handed in a progress report at the National Assembly on Friday detailing its vision and goals. Our Jim Young gil reports. The Minister and Vice Ministers of the Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning were front and centre at the National Assembly on Friday, where they fielded questions from the Parliamentary Science Committee. Some of the questions centred on just what the ministry, founded at the start of the Park Geun-hye administration, does. It has been a year since the ministry was established. However, what exactly the ministry does is unclear. I've heard there have been a lot of flaws during the working processes. It seems the Korean people and companies do not understand the policy-making function of the new ministry. For instance, 86 percent of companies think the ministry is functioning to its fullest. To give lawmakers a better understanding of the ministry's mission, Minister Choi mung laid out the various projects it's involved in. The government has increased investment in creative economy projects, projects that promote the integration of information technology with conventional industries such as agriculture and tourism. The ministry said it would inject some 94 million U.S. dollars in a total of 30 creative economy projects this year, a sharp increase from the 18 million dollars invested last year. The projects are part of the Park Geun-hye administration's vision for a creative economy which seeks new and inventive business opportunities and more jobs by fusing information technology and other industries. Just last week, a special law went into effect that creates a new commission that will oversee policies on the information, communication and technology sectors. The ministry said the new commission will function to improve efficiency in policy making by seeking feedback from local firms on the challenges they face and having them reflected in the country's policies. Jim Young-gil, Arirang News. 
The Korean households were tighter with their money last year, despite a bump in overall income. According to data by Statistics Korea released Friday, the ratio of consumption to disposable income came to 73.4% in 2013. That this is the lowest since the agency began compiling data in 2003. An agency official attributed the drop to increased government support for child care, which has led to cut in expenditures. While they are spending less, the average monthly income of Korean households grew 2.1% in 2013 from a year earlier to about 3,900 U.S. dollars. And some news that you K-pop fans out there won't want to miss. A musical that stars K-pop idols and tells the story of how the global K-pop craze started back in the 1990s, kicked off on this Friday and will run until next month. Our cultural correspondent Park ji won has the details. Set in 1994, this dance musical takes audiences to a club called Moon Knight. Moon Knight was a real club that existed in Itaewon, Seoul during the 1990s and is considered to be the place where K-pop dance music began. Legendary Korean dancers of the time converged on the club and many of them became the first generation of stars on the Korean dance music scene. Yang Hyun Seok, former member of the legendary Korean dance group Sotejian Boys, and now a founder of the major K pop label YG Entertainment, which created huge K pop stars like Big Bang and 21. Park Jin Young, the famous dancer and singer and founder of another major K pop company, JYP Entertainment, which represents K pop groups like 2PM and Miss A. Both frequented the club along with many others. That's why music insiders say Moon Knight was the birthplace of Hallyu. To tell the story of this epic club, members of current K-pop idol group M Black, Seung Ho and Chun Dung star in the musical, along with actor and b-boy Park Jae-min and global award-winning b-boys. People nowadays know about Korean K-pop at 2010s, but actually. K-pop history started from 1980s. You can see the culture of 80s, but the most recent dance, old songs, new songs, but new fashions and old cultures. You can see a lot of things just mix it in the same show. So just hopefully a lot of people will like that kind of mixture of K-pop history. The musical provides everything from flashy dance moves to heart-touching scenes, so I hope audiences can have fun and enjoy themselves for the 100 minutes of the show's running time. The musical opens this Friday and will run until March 23rd at Sejong M Theater at the Sejong Center for the Performing Arts. Park ji Arirang News. time for a wrap-up of stories making headlines around the world. From an Obama de la Lama meeting to the latest on the Ukraine unrest, Yudian joins us live from the Arirang News Center with all the latest. Lian, take it away. Jihei, I want to start with a White House announcement about an upcoming meeting between U.S. President Barack Obama and the Dalai Lama, Tibet's exiled spiritual leader, which sparked an immediate protest from China. The White House says Obama is scheduled to meet with the Dalai Lama in Washington on Friday amid rising concerns over the deteriorating human rights situation in the Tibetan areas. The statement did underscore, however, that the U.S. continues to recognize Tibet as part of China, with the implication there being that it's in no way looking to support Tibetan independence. Early on, the U.S. and China relations have hit a rough patch in recent months as China has begun taking a more assertive stance in the East China Sea. Now, can we expect this meeting to further chill Sino-U.S. relations? 
Almost certainly, Jihei, within hours following the White House announcement, the Chinese government urged the U.S. to cancel the meeting, warning that it will seriously harm bilateral relations. The Chinese foreign ministry in a statement said the meeting would be a gross interference in China's internal affairs and called it a serious violation of the norms of international relations. As you all know, the Dalai Lama has been calling for greater religious freedoms and autonomy through nonviolent means, while Beijing accuses the Dalai Lama of encouraging Tibetan independence through violence. Now over to Ukraine, where an agreement has reportedly been reached to end the political crisis after escalating violence has left at least 75 more dead in the past two days. The Ukrainian presidential office says it reached a deal with opposition leaders and European foreign ministers after marathon overnight talks, adding that the deal will be signed later on Friday evening. The opposition leaders, however, have yet to confirm the agreement. Now, earlier on Friday, the European Union has decided to slap sanctions on Ukraine in response to the recent uptick in violence. Here's EU foreign policy chief Catherine Ashton. I suspend export licenses for equipment for internal repression. And we've asked the relevant working bodies of the Council to make the necessary preparations immediately. That implementation will be taken forward in the light of developments in Ukraine. As ever, we continue to work in close cooperation with the international And this just in, Ukrainian President Yanukovych has just announced early elections and is promising a coalition government. I'll have more details on that in the later newscast. Now, China is bracing for an intense heavy wave of smog over the next three days. Beijing, which has been under fire to take effective measures against pollution, cranked up its pollution alert a notch higher to orange for the first time on Friday. Now, that's the second highest level and calls for children and the elderly to stay indoors, with some factory activities put on hold. The alert was raised after Beijing was criticized by state media last weekend for failing to act promptly against high pollution levels. Now that wraps up today's look at what's making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here next week. Koreans woke up this Friday morning to a new Olympic medal, but not the one fans were expecting. In a free skating program, Russia took home a controversial gold, while Korea's own Kim Yona took the silver. But for more on the competition marred by questionable scores from judges, we go over to our Connie Lee standing by at the new studio. Connie, fill us in. Well, the free skating event on Thursday, like always, was full of expectations, hope and anxiety. But in the end, shock and awe filled the air. Let's start with looking at Kim Yuna's performance, dancing to tango music, Adios No Nino. She went last out of 24 contenders, and despite all the pressure for her to defend her Olympic title, she showed us a flawless performance. Critics praised her for her precise jumps and spins, but it looks like this performance was not enough for the judges. She felt fell short in the free skating event to Russia's Adelina Stonikova, who performed to a loud, excited crowd in her own home turf. Now, the 17-year-old Russian star did have one more jump than Kim, but she did have a little slip-up in landing on two feet. But still, her scores took her to the top and landed her a gold medal. This was Russia's first gold medal in this free skating event. Now, Italy's Carolina Kostner landed third, giving her the bronze medal. Now mentioned before, there is growing controversy over the final results of this event. Both fans, insiders and other athletes have spoken out, with some saying that Kim Yuna was robbed of her gold medal at Sochi. Social media sites also exploded with those criticizing the judges, expressing shock that Kim's flawless performance did not earn a higher score than Sonikova. There are also online petitions where people are asking the International Olympic Committee to investigate the judging process and the actual judges who decided the final scores. And as for Queen Yana herself, in an inter interview after her performance, she said that she's okay with the results, saying that she's glad to have given a clean performance and also thanked her fans for their continued support throughout her Olympic career. 
Now let's move on, going to an Olympic win that is far from controversial. To the women's curling event, the Canadian team stopped Sweden from winning their third straight Olympic title. On Thursday, Canada took the gold 6-3. Now this Canadian team was undefeated at this year's Olympics, winning 11 straight games. Now curling is Canada's second most popular sport, but this is their first gold in curling since 1998. And here in Korea, you can see here our Korean team, Curling is actually a new sport with the Korean women's team being in the Olympics for the first time this year. Now they were eliminated early on in the games, but for them, they say it's all about Pyeongchang 2018. So we'll just have to wait um, and look forward to them then. And with that, let's now go to the current medal standings on the last few days of the Sochi Olympics. Norway remains in the number one spot with 10 gold medals. The U.S. has moved up the ranks and is in number two with a whopping of 25 Olympic medals. Germany is in third and Russia and Canada round out the top five. Korea remains in the top 20 as it moved up one spot with its newest silver medal and now is in 15th place. But Korea could earn at least two more medals over the weekend. In the last three days of Sochi, there are still a number of opportunities with Korean athletes expected to compete for a medal in short track speed skating. Now, one athlete who could possibly bring home maybe a gold is Shim suk -hee. She is a 17-year-old who got a lot of attention earlier this week in the ladies' relay race. Now, this was a girl who was able to win the gold for the team in the final lap. At Sochi, she also won the silver in the ladies' 1500 meter finals. Now for a look at the upcoming games, including the speed skating quarterfinals later tonight. Let's take a closer look at the schedule. A lot to look forward to there, Connie. But while we are in the home stretch of the Sochi Olympics, the spotlight is gradually shifting to the next host city, the Korean resort town of Pyeongchang. And I'm sure we can definitely take some lessons from how the Sochi Games were run. That's absolutely right, Ji Hei. And for more on that, our Song ji -san sat down with the head of Pyeongchang's organizing committee in Sochi. For the over 200 personnel dispatched to Sochi from Pyeongchang, Nothing is too big or too small to go unchecked or unobserved. The pressure is on, as in less than four years' time, the eyes of the world will be focused on whether Pyeongchang is ready to take up the mantle as an Olympic host city. As the next in line, how would the chief organizer of Pyeongchang 2018 rate the way the Sochi Games have been run? Overall, we believe it was a successful Olympic Games. Sochi 2014 had all the big venues in one place at the Olympic Park. The weather and the volunteers were also very pleasant. Pyeongchang is more compact due to the fact that all our clusters are within 30 minutes of each other. But after studying the way it is organized here, we want to reinforce the efficiency of our venues. With the curtain drawing down on Sochi, the world will watch as the Olympic flag is passed to the Korean delegation during Sunday's closing ceremony. The ceremony is expected to culminate with a grand performance of Korean dance and various mixes of Korea's traditional song, Arirang. Korea is relatively less well known than many other countries around the world. So we want to incorporate that mysterious oriental side when introducing Pyeongchang. And as Pyeongchang 2018 marks the 30th anniversary of this whole Summer Olympics in 1988, we want to portray Korea, now a developed country, from a country that was catching up with others three decades ago. Kim adds it is crucially important Korea does more than just host the games. He say the nation's athletes need to win medals. Aside from everything else, what really counts is how well the host country's athletes do. Russia has succeeded in that up until now. And I want to stress that Korea must work together to boost our chances. I've seen the potential we have, not just in skating, but in winter sliding events and freestyle skiing. I'm sure Korean athletes can make Pyeongchang their stage in four years' time.
Songjisun, Arirang News, Sochi. Now, the 16 days of the Winter Games at Sochi all come to an end this Sunday, February 23rd. And the closing ceremony will be at 8 p.m. Russian time, 1 a.m. here in Korea. And you know, Jihei, a number of Korean singers will also perform at the Sochi closing ceremony, including soprano Cho Soo-mi and singer Lee seung Chul. Right, and then the Olympic torch will be passed to Korea's Pyeongchang, am I right? Right. Okay, thanks, Kati, for the updates. We'll see you back with more updates in two hours' time. And time for a check on the weather with our Kim Bogyong at the Weather Center. Now, Bogyong, it was another sunny winter day here in Seoul. And I understand the weekend has more of the same in store. That's right, Jihei. It'll be a great weekend for outdoor activities. Currently, the nation is under the influence of a high-pressure system from the West Sea, which is why we're seeing absolutely clear skies across the map. And tomorrow looks to be just as clear as today. Well, this morning, some parts of the eastern regions got to see two times the normal levels of fine dust, but readings are now back to normal. However, please keep in mind that the unwanted visitor from China may come back tomorrow afternoon. Other than that, Tokto is forecast to see 5 to 10 centimeters of snow. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul will mix it to 8 degrees while cities down south reach the low teens. Moving on to other regions, Daejeon and Jeju peak at 9 degrees while Tokto tops out at 3. Well, hope you have a wonderful Friday night and back to you, Jihei. Thanks, Pogyang. And that brings us to the end of our newscast. I'm Yu Jihei in Seoul. Thanks for watching.